In this video we're going to revisit the idea of rate of change and we're going to look at it a lot more closely than we did at the beginning of this chapter. The key idea with rate of change is that the rate of change of a function is really the same thing as the slope of the function. So we're going to be using the slope formula quite a bit and if you remember from your previous math courses the slope of a function is equal to the change in y over the change in x. This is a notation we'll use a lot in this class, the delta representing change. Uh, so change in y would be um, the difference in the y values. And so that translates to this formula right here, which we recognize as the slope formula. Um, typically we'll write the formula again like this, though. It's a little bit simpler and it translates a little bit better into the calculus that we'll be doing later on. So let's visit this idea by working a few example problems. We want to find in this example the rate of change of this function, the average rate of change of this function from the, uh, from the x value x equals 1 to x equals 3, so over the interval from 1 to 3. Um, so what we'll do first is we'll evaluate the function at those two points, so f of 1 just plug 1 into the function so we get 1 squared minus 1 and that's going to be 0 which means that the point 1 comma 0 is going to be the left end point of our interval and plugging in 3 to the function f of 3 equals 3 squared minus 1 which is going to give us 9 minus 1 or 8 um, and that means that the point 3 8 will be the right end point of our interval. So all we have to do now is find the slope of the line that goes through those two points because um, we're looking for the average rate of change. We're just looking for that slope of the secant line. So we're going to use that slope formula that we just looked at, change in y over the change in x, uh, which in this case would be 8 minus 0 over 3 minus 1. Um, keep in mind when we're doing the change in y over the change in x, it doesn't matter which y value or x value we put first. We could do 3 minus 1 over 8. I'm sorry. We could do 0 minus 8 over 1 minus 3, or we could do 8 minus 0 over 3 minus 1. We just need to be sure we do it in the same order. Um, so the second point first on top and bottom, or the first point first. So what we end up getting here. Uh, this is a very simple one, 8 over 2, which simplifies to 4. So that tells us that for this function, x squared minus 1, the average rate of change, which is equivalent to the slope of the secant line over the interval from 1 to 3, is just 4. Let's look at the same function, but kind of generalize it a little bit for that function. So we'll use variables for the endpoints end of the interval. Um, so we'll do the same thing. We'll evaluate the function at the left end point, and just plugging a in for x, we get a squared minus 1, which tells us that the point a, comma, a squared minus 1 is on the function. And that's going to be our left end point. And evaluate at the right end point, f of b equals b squared minus 1. Uh, and that tells us that the point b, comma, b squared minus 1 is on the function. And just like the last example, we're going to find the slope of the line going through those two points. Even though we don't know exactly what those points are, we can do the same thing with the variables. So we're looking at the change in y over the change in x. I like to, to use the second point first when we're using this formula. So the y value on our second point is going to be b squared minus 1. And we'll subtract the y value of our first point, which is a squared minus 1. And that's going to be over the change in x, which is going to be b minus a, subtracting these x values here. Doing a little bit of simplification, we can do this in our head a little bit. If we distribute this minus, we can make that a negative a squared and a plus 1. And we can see now that the minus 1 and the plus 1 will cancel each other out. So what we end up with is b squared minus a squared over b minus a. We're at a point here where we 
could box our answer and say that's our final answer. Although I, I see here something that we might be able to simplify. Um, if you remember the difference of squares, we can factor the b squared minus a squared to b minus a times b plus a. And note that we have the factor b minus a on top and b minus a in the denominator. Um, and making one big assumption here, we can cancel those out. b minus a and b minus a divide the top and bottom by b minus a, and that simplifies to b plus a. And that's going to be our final answer. The assumption we made, though, when we canceled the b minus a is that a is not equal to b. And that's really important here because if a is equal to b, then what we're doing is we're reducing by 0. And we know we can't divide by 0. So over this interval from a to b, assuming that a and b are not the same point, then the average rate of change is just going to be b minus a. If we go back and look at the previous problem very briefly here, um, and we say that a was 1 and b was 3, um, then the average rate of change from that formula we just got is b plus a, which is just going to be 3 plus 1. So what that formula allowed us to do is generalize this, plug in any two endpoints, and we're going to get the value of the average rate of change very quickly. Um, in this case, it would be 4. So let's skip over this one now and do one more. So we'll look later at why exactly we would do something like this, but we're going to say the left point is at A, and we're going to let h be the width of our interval. So the right end point then would be a plus h. So let's find the average rate of change here. Uh, we'll go ahead and do this through the whole process, even though we just found an, uh, a formula that will allow us to do it for this particular function. We'll go through all the steps and just see why this works. So just like the previous examples, we'll evaluate the function at the left and right end points. So we have f of a equals a squared minus 1, which means that point a, a squared minus 1 is on the function. Uh, that's the same as what we had before. And we'll evaluate at a plus h for the right endpoint. And so we're going to evaluate the function a plus h squared minus 1. And let's do a little simplification here before we move on. Uh, we'll expand this here. If we rewrite a plus h squared as a plus h times a plus h, then we can expand that, and this ends up being equal to a squared plus 2ah plus h squared, and then we need to remember to subtract our 1. Now, that gives us a really long expression. Uh, for the value of our, our function at that point, a plus h, um, but we'll be able to simplify our difference quotient later on when with it expanded like that. So, um, let's write the point. So we're going to have the point a plus h, comma, a squared plus 2ah plus h squared minus 1. So these two, and let me draw attention to them here, I'll circle them. These two points are going to be the endpoints of our interval. So it's just a matter, again, of plugging it into the slope formula, the difference in y over the difference in x's. y values, those are a big, long, crazy expression. Um, a squared plus 2ah plus h squared minus 1 is our second y value minus a squared minus 1 and don't forget the parentheses there that's really important uh, because we are going to have to distribute a negative and let me take a moment here and move some of this work out of the way give us a little bit more room okay so that's our difference in y's on top, and then on the bottom, we will have the difference in x values. So we're going to have a plus h, that's the x value of the second point, 
minus a, which is the x value of the first point. Okay, now if we distribute our negative here, so we're going to make that a plus, negative a squared plus 1, just like we did in the last problem. Um, we're going to have the minus 1 and the plus 1 are going to cancel each other out, and the a squared and the minus a squared will cancel each other out. So what we are left with, then, is 2ah on top plus h squared over, and then on the bottom, in the denominator, we see that our a and our minus a will cancel each other out, and we just have h. Now there is one more thing we can do to simplify. Just like when we did the interval from a to b, we could simplify by a minus b, making the assumption that a was not equal to b, so we didn't cancel by 0. If you notice here, we have h in both terms in the numerator, and we could kind of formalize this here by factoring out an h and get 2a plus h times h on top. Um, and we can cancel the h's out, making one big assumption again, and we'll get back to that in a second. Um, but we get 2a plus h here, and that's going to be our average rate of change. But that assumption we made is that h is not equal to 0. Okay, so we've done a few problems here. Um, we did one problem where we were given constant values. We were actually given numerical values for the endpoints. We plugged it in. We found the average rate of change. And then in two different ways, we generalized the average rate of change for this function. One way, we, we chose variables as our endpoints. And the other way, we chose a variable for our left endpoint and then chose another variable for the width of our, um, for our, our interval. Uh, in this case, h is the width of the interval. Both of those methods are going to be very useful to us later on when we start computing instantaneous rates of change. So let's look at one more thing here. This difference quotient is going to be a fraction, a quotient that we're going to see fairly often in this class. Um, it's going to help us define the first major part of calculus, which is the derivative. Um, so let's look at an example here that tells us how to do that. I'm sorry, we'll save that example for the next video.